It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Kimberly Matheson Berkey joins us to talk about her book, Helaman, A Brief Theological Introduction. It's part of the Maxwell Institute's Brief Theological Introductions to the Book of Mormon series. Berkey says the book of Helaman is one of the best kept secrets of the Book of Mormon, sometimes overlooked, but a pivotal moment in the history of the book's peoples. Berkey's a doctoral student in theology at Loyola University, Chicago, where she studies the philosophy of religion. She also serves on the boards of the Latter-day Saint Theology Seminar and the Book of Mormon Studies Association. You can learn more about the Brief Theological Introduction book series at mi.byu.edu slash brief. Questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to me at mipodcast.byu.edu. All right, let's get into another Brief Theological Introduction. We're looking at the Book of Helaman. Kimberly Matheson Berkey, welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast today. Thank you. It's a delight to be here. And we're joining each other via Skype, which is the most effective method of physical distancing during the pandemic. Correct. Where are you joining us from? I am sitting in my kitchen in Chicago, Illinois. And I'm down here in my basement uh, just hanging out with my microphone and my laptop. (laughs) And we're talking today about your new book, Helaman. It's part of the Brief Theological Introduction series to the Book of Mormon. And I think that every author in the series that I've talked to so far, they came to see their own book as central to the Book of Mormon itself, shockingly. (laughs) When you spend so much time with one particular book in the scripture, you tend to recognize its importance in a new way, or at least that's what the impression I've got from other authors. Do you feel that uh, is the case with you as well? That's a really good question. I I don't know that I would say that. I've I've certainly come to see its importance in new ways, but I don't know that I walked away thinking it was the most central book. But um, faced with that provocation, I think I do see newly how the Book of Helaman represents so many themes and threads from the Book of Mormon that come to a head in a new way. So we see the Nephites reaching kind of more precipitous collapse than they do anywhere else in the Book of Mormon prior to their own actual destruction at the end of the book. We are setting up the climactic arrival of Christ in the next book in a new way. So I do think there's a kind of urgency to Helaman that uh, is maybe worth thinking through. Your introduction says that Helaman, you think, is easily one of the best kept secrets in the Book of Mormon. What what did you mean by that secret? Mm, so that was a, uh, I have come to see, yeah, maybe that's the good flip side of your question. Instead of coming to see the way that the Book of Helaman is more central than I had thought, I think I came to see how it's more easily overlooked. So what I meant by that statement was that there are so many gems in this book but we often overlook them. I think it's for a couple of reasons, what that I mentioned there in the introduction. One is that the Book of Helaman is just so short. It is a surprisingly small little book, and it is overlooked, I think, in part because of the prestige of the book on either side. So the Book of Alma that comes right before is very long. It is full of wars, lots of fun uh, events happening there at the end of the book, the kind of thing that my seven-year-old son gets very excited about. Uh, The Book of Alma also has these long, gorgeous theological sermons. Alma is a real sermonic genius. And so for those reasons, the Book of Helaman can feel a little bit uh, underwhelming compared to the length and the richness of Alma. Then on the other side, you have the Book of Third Nephi, which hardly needs any description. That's where Jesus shows up. And so it's easy to feel like the Book of Helaman is just an afterword to Alma or a kind of preamble to Third Nephi, and we rarely ever take a minute to look at Helaman in its own right. I think another thing that makes that difficult, as you point out in your first chapter of the book, is that Helaman opens up on a scene that looks very familiar to Book of Mormon readers. So set the stage for us. What's happening as as the Book of Helaman opens, and how is it similar to other moments of the Book of Mormon? Right. It looks like exactly the sort of thing we've come to expect from the Book of Alma. So we have a chief judge who has recently died, and there's some contention over who's going to occupy that office next. We're very familiar with that after the Book of Alma. And we also have, out of this conflict, some dissenters heading across into Lamanite territory to stir up some armies there to come back and fight. And so soon enough, we have 
um, a Lamanite army on the Nephite's doorstep. Again, that should feel very familiar. We even have many of the same characters. So the general Moroniha, who figured at the end of the Book of Alma, he is the general who leads the Nephites to victory here in the opening chapter. At first, it looks like this is just more of the same. And it looks like it's more of the same. I, I noticed you said looks like more of the same. So why is it not more of the same? It's not more of the same because I think Mormon Mormon has editorialized this book to show us that it's not. So he, for instance, has started a new book here. If this were more of the same, he might have kept it in the previous book, in the Book of Alma. The other thing that seems to me really significant is that when the Nephites start to fight over who is going to be the next chief judge there in Helaman chapter 1, there are three options. There are three contenders for the judgment seat, three brothers who are fighting. Uh, and that has never happened before in the Book of Mormon. Usually when there is a kind of civic conflict of this sort, it's a split that runs in just two directions only. We have two brothers or two contenders. And this goes all the way back to the very beginning of the Book of Mormon. So Nephi had more than one other brother, certainly, but it's very clear that that was divided into just two camps. It's Nephi, pitted against Laman and Lemuel, treated as a unit. So even though there are three brothers in that conflict, it splits just two ways. At the opening of Helaman 1, that's not the case anymore. We have three brothers and the conflict splits three ways. The people are now divided into three. And to me, that seems like a sign that conflict is ramping up among the Nephites. Things are not as stable as they had once been. You also notice there's a pretty extreme moment of violence that we haven't seen previously in the text as well with the murder of the chief judge. That's a first too, right? Yes. Uh-huh. And it's a first that's going to be repeated several times in the Book of Helaman. It has, the Book of Helaman has more murdered chief judges per capita than any other book in the Book of Mormon. <laughs> the other thing I noticed at the outset here at the beginning of the Book of Helaman, I think it's in chapter, yeah, we're still in chapter two where Mormon just throws out a outright spoiler. <laughs> What's he doing there? <laughs> Yeah, so what you're referring to is that this is this is the first time Mormon himself in his own voice has told us the Nephites will be destroyed at the end of the book. And I think it's significant that he doesn't tell us this until we reach the book of Helaman. He could have told us this at any number of moments where things look pretty dire for the Nephites, but he saves it for Helaman, I think, because it's in the book of Helaman that we as readers can finally see how bad things are for the Nephites. Their, the trajectory that will ultimately land them in total destruction, that becomes visible to us for the first time in Helaman. And I think that's part of what Mormon wants to show. So not only is he making this, writing the story in a way that reveals that to us readers, but he's going to He's going to point it out to us explicitly as well. You take some time to dig into the actual threats that the Nephites are facing here. There's, there are two different threats that the text focuses on, Coriantumr's army and Kishkuman's band. Is Kishkuman, is that uh, how you've been pronouncing it? Let's That's check how that. I say it, but I, okay, I was not there, so I can't, I can't verify yes. that. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk about that. Coriantumr's army and Kishkuman's band, these are two threats that the Nephites are facing. I really liked your comparison of these two groups. Well, thank you. Then let's let's dig it out. Yeah, I think it's very interesting that not only does the Book of Helaman open on this conflict between three brothers with a kind of um, more of the same kind of thing we've seen since the Book of Alma, but now with new intensity, uh, we also get this really interesting comparison between the two main threats that show up on the stage here. And as you say, that's Coriantumr's army. He's the guy leading this angry Lamanite group that comes into Zarahemla. And then also Kishkuman's band. This is like the proto-secret combination, the first instance. And I, it seems to me that Mormon is capitalizing on what we might call a kind of um, historical happenstance that these two groups show up on the scene together. And so Mormon's going to turn it into a teaching moment. What he does is he seems to want us to compare them. Um, and what's, what is noticeable to me, at least, is that Coriantumr's army is very overt. It's very obvious in its aims, in its direction. They just march right onto center stage. They march straight into the capital of Zarahemla. We know where they've come from. We know where they're going. They come dressed in armor. Coriantumr's very interested in the spectacle of his own victory. Meanwhile, we have Kishkuman's band. He started to form this secret combination, which is, not surprisingly, 
a band focused on secrecy and they are not brazen. They are all about being invisible, being hidden, sneaking away where no one can see them. They don't want anyone to know their name, their identity. And so it's for this reason, I think, that Mormon emphasizes the use of disguise in Helaman chapter two, where Coriantumr's army comes wearing armor, something that you have to recognize vis visually in order for it to function. Uh, Helaman's servant infiltrates the secret band with the use of disguise. Disguise is something that you need, you, you can't know that it's a disguise or else it has failed. And so I think that Mormon is setting up the themes of visibility and invisibility in this opening chapter in the way that he compares a very visible army with a, a secret combination more bent on staying invisible and hidden. I think it bears repeating too that the record keeper Mormon himself has is a military minded person. And so is he, is, he's sort of assessing these military threats and he's going to draw moral lessons out of them. This is a pretty basic way of summing up Mormon as a record keeper. Did you find that to, to hold true through the book of Helaman? I did. So I hinted just a moment ago that for me, this seems to be the moral lesson that I understand Mormon to be giving us out of, out of his analysis of this portion of Nephite history. What's really plaguing the Nephites at this time on Mormon's telling is that they are not attending to the kind of invisible moral undercurrents of their nation at this moment. They are distracted and focused on things that catch their eye. Things like, say, Lamanite armies that march right into your capital city, but also things like wealth uh, and economy. And they're very, very atten attentive to the Lamanites, their enemies at this period. They're just so focused on looking everywhere, but at themselves and evaluating their own moral failings in this period. They are so focused on everyone else and on visual markers of success that they have failed to attend to the secret things that threaten them most keenly. Yes, here's a quote from you. You write, what takes place in secret is often far more consequential than what takes place in the open. In a tragic illustration of human nature, the Nephites model our natural eagerness to prioritize the visible over the invisible. This comes out in a discussion about hearts. I had never noticed this in the text. You find the metaphor of hearts or Mormon is using heart in multiple ways here. Talk about that. Yeah, this was a genuine surprise to me. Um, in the first two chapters, so these very chapters where Mormon is comparing Coriantumr's army and Kishkumen's band, it's easy for us as readers to get distracted by that conflict or by, by the movements of these two groups. They're very interesting, but there is also a subtler theme of hearts that runs through these two chapters. So Mormon repeats the word heart several times. We have Coriantumr marching into the heart of Nephite lands, the literal center, their capital city. We have Kishkumen telling all of his heart to Helaman's servant. This is how he ends up getting killed. And then uh, in just this beautiful narrative irony, Kishkumen is actually stabbed right in the heart by that same servant. So the degree to which he has disclosed himself is the degree to which he himself winds up threatened. And the same is true of the Nephites. Not only has Coriantumr marched right into the heart of their lands, it's a heart that they left unguarded. It says they had not kept sufficient guards here in the heart of their land. There's a kind of um, false sense of security that has led the Nephites to leave unguarded the things that are nearest to them and that are actually, in some ways, the most threatened. Right. You write here that the Nephites are vulnerable at their core, not just in terms of their geography and military strategy, but also in terms of their souls. Also, in, So Mormons operating on these multiple levels in ways that I had never noticed until you pointed it out here. That's something that I, I can tell is going to stick with me as I, as I return to the Book of Mormon in the future. So thank you for that. You bet. Precisely. It's stuck with me as well. We're speaking today with Kim Matheson Berkey, Kimberly Matheson Berkey, but uh, she goes by Kim. She's a doctoral student in theology at Loyola University, Chicago, where she studies the philosophy of religion. Let's take a minute to talk a little bit about your background before we move on to chapter two. Then how did you come to be the one to write the Helaman volume? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I've been interested in the book of Helaman for many years. I would say this is the book where I got kind of my first bit of training in uh, theological readings of scripture. So a friend and I decided that we wanted to give 
some sustained close reading to a passage in the Book of Mormon that usually doesn't get a lot of attention. And one of the best candidates for that is the Book of Helaman. The Book of Helaman, as I said, just gets overlooked, unfortunately. And so that's where I cut my teeth. I spent several months just going very slowly and carefully through the Book of Helaman. Uh, and what I found there, I've stuck away in notes and it has continued to fund my research for you know many years since. And then people having heard me uh, express my love of the Book of Helaman, I guess I did that loudly enough that when it was time for authors to be selected, I was invited to write this volume specifically. Have you found that your training in the philosophy of religion impacted writing the book at all? Because in this book, you're writing specifically to believers, to people who accept the text as scripture. Philosophy of religion looks at a lot of different faiths and, and is a bit more theoretical. Did you see overlap there between your academic work and the scholarship that's sort of more dedicated to, to faith building? I did. For for me, that overlap comes in, in the way that philosophy teaches you to look at religion or at a religious text. Philosophy is kind of a, a discipline that is famously abstract, but I found that really helpful because sometimes it's necessary to be able to see more abstract patterns in the details of scripture. So for instance, when Mormon has two armies showing up in Zarahemla in the same year, it's useful to be able to take a step back and ask, well, how do these groups operate? Can we compare them? What general patterns do I see in the way that these details are being presented? That search for general patterns in textual particulars is something that I learned from philosophy specifically. Several of the people I've spoken with have talked about how their academic training hasn't necessarily just been some sort of challenge to faith, but it's been a supplement and something that has even enriched faith. Have you, have you found that to be the case? I have, for sure. Again, academic training, in my experience, my academic training has been uh, an education in different perspectives. And it's so useful to be able to come at questions from a multitude of different angles, multiple angles, um, precisely because when I have a question that I feel stuck on, just as often as not, I'm stuck because I'm stuck within a single framework. I am, I'm coming at it from just one angle and not finding the way through. And so I need to pause and have a different angle of approach. And once I do that, I can usually find my way through. So in my case, yes, academic training has been an excellent resource for navigating the difficult kinds of questions that inevitably arise in a life of faith. All right, let's move on to chapter two now, Kim. The Book of Helaman keeps an eye focused on economic matters, an important consideration in times of trouble, obviously. And I think we're experiencing that right now, that when there's unrest and uncertainty, that that affects livelihoods, that affects life. So what's happening economically in the text right here? When Mormon picks up in what is Helaman three, this was the start of his original chapter two, according to eight. 1830 chapter breaks, but we know it as Helaman chapter three. When that text opens, apparently the Nephites are experiencing an incredible economic expansion. We have so much talk of them um, expanding their territory outward. They're building new cities. There's talk of developing a shipping industry. So much mention of population growth, technological advancement, territorial expansion. What's curious about this is that Mormon doesn't spend much time on it. This seems to be almost a decade of unprecedented growth for the Nephites, and Mormon dispatches it pretty quickly. He wants to zoom straight past this. He does, he does seem to want to mention it. It's going to be important to the story, uh, but he moves through it very quickly. And as he's moving through it, you pick up the themes that he's laying out here in terms of an individualistic approach to economic matters versus kind of a covenant approach to different matters. Let's talk about that. Right. So the other thing that he does here in Helaman chapter, well, in, in this next stretch of chapters, is once again, Mormon gives us a comparison. So right alongside all of this ec economic expansion among Nephites that trains them to think in terms of um, individuals and individual success and acquisition, his comparison for that is the family of Helaman. So Helaman is chief judge at this point, but Mormon decides to give us a view into his family. And Helaman is described as a man who walks in the ways of his father. He keeps the commandments of God. And that to me is a really striking juxtaposition with the economic expansion of the Nephites because Helaman is not concerned with personal success. He's more interested in ancestral tradition. He wants to follow the path cut for him by his father. We get mention here of his sons and he gives them the names Nephi and Lehi. And that I think is significant because in this moment, again, when it's 
every man for himself and what can I acquire financially and where am I going to build my new cities? Helaman has his eye on the past in a way that seems to me very reminiscent of the covenant. He's not just walking in the path of his father, he's thinking all the way back to the beginning of the Book of Mormon, to the fathers, Nephi and Lehi, and he names his sons for them. So I, there in that portion of the book, I try to draw out a kind of covenant story into which Helaman is trying to write his family. He wants his sons to grow up focused on their covenants, on their fathers, on the religious traditions that he himself is trying to walk in. And you see some negative side effects of that as well, as you point out in this, in your book, that the Book of Mormon spends a lot of time comparing Nephites and Lamanites, and most of the time in, in negative ways, holding up the Lamanites as a foil to the Nephites' righteousness. And you, here's a quote from you, you say, readers might well be suspicious of how persistently the Lamanites come to play in the Nephites' self-reflection. What about that? Great. So this is another moment, this is, comes in Helaman 4, where as you say, Mormon shows us that comparison, although he is using comparison in this editorial way to teach us moral lessons, he also is aware that the Nephites at this time are incredibly comparative people. And he wants to be clear that editorial comparison for moral lessons is very different from a kind of other focused, judgmental kind of comparison. And that's what we see with the Nephites. This shows up in Helaman chapter four, when the Nephites are at war with the Lamanites, and it's going very badly for them. And you would think that at this moment, the Nephites might finally wake up to their wickedness, finally repent, turn things around. And it looks like they start to. And by the way, take a second to explain what that wickedness looks like. Like, what are they actually doing? So problems the Nephites are having, there are so, so many. They start certainly, we can see the symptoms of them in the incredible violence and political polarization of that period, which should sound a little familiar to us. Um, the, the Nephites, again, as I said, this is the first time that chief judges have ever been murdered in history. There's a whole lot of political conflict. We know that following the economic expansion, there's the rise of economic inequality in new ways for the Nephites. They have become increasingly callous, it seems, toward the, the less well-off members of their society. Uh, and all of these things have now spun up into a situation of such pride that the Nephites find themselves on the, the bad end of what we know colloquially as the pride cycle. Okay, good. So here, the Nephites are uh, once again at war with the Lamanites, and it's not going well for them. So they've, they've reached a point where they can't regain any more territorial holdings. And you would think that this would be the perfect moment for them to stop and self-reflect, maybe why are things going so badly? What's happened to the kind of divine fortune that we usually can trust in from God. And it looks like they start to. So in Helaman chapter four, there's this moment where the Nephites start to think about their past. They start to reflect on their past and they do see some sins there, some wickedness that they might want to change. But running right alongside all of that past reflection, there's this, this regular switch in verb tense in the verbs in chapter four. And so all of a sudden they jump into the present and what they do in the present is they compare themselves to the Lamanites. So it looks something like this. They see that they had been wicked, even like the Lamanites right now. And this happens so repeatedly that I began to wonder in reading it, if maybe there's something symptomatic going on, which is a way of, of saying, it looks like there's a, something a little fishy happening here. The Nephites seem willing to recognize their past sins, but only if they're given the opportunity to compare themselves with the Lamanites. So they, it doesn't, it, this is not so honest a self-assessment as it first appears. They seem willing to introspect, but every time they get close to really seeing something about themselves that needs to change, they take a hard left turn and start vilifying the Lamanites for being wicked and being corrupt. Their own moral failings can't hold their attention. What does hold their attention is how much they hate the other guy. And then into this, Mormon weaves an editorial reflection to describe the ways that God's spirit cannot be with them because they're not focused on themselves and their own moral improvement. They're focused on what's wrong with everybody else. With all of this in mind, you talk a lot about how the text is focusing specifically on where the Nephites are looking. Uh, the visual is a theme of your book that just comes up again and again. So maybe just one more word about that, that, that the text is actually specific about where they're looking. Yes. The Nephites, in the book of Helaman, Mormon diagnoses the Nephites as a people who are consistently focused outward. 
They are focused on others. They're focused on Lamanites. They're focused on wealth. They're focused on economic expansion. They are constantly looking elsewhere, anywhere other than themselves. Uh, they are not focused on the threats in their own families, the kind of conflict between brothers with which the book opens. They're not focused on themselves enough to notice the secret combinations taking root in their midst. Um, if I had to name one theme for the book of Helaman, it would be this. This is why it comes up so often. Uh, Mormon seems to be diagnosing the problem with the Nephites as a problem of sight. They are looking in the wrong places, and as a result, they're setting themselves up for destruction. And we're coming up on Helaman chapter 5 now, which you say is perhaps the most intertextual chapter in the Book of Mormon. Let's talk about intertextuality as a way to read scripture, what it is, what it means, and how you saw it here in Helaman chapter 5. Great. So intertextuality is a kind of fancy word that academics use to describe texts that refer to other texts. They're making allusions, they're echoing, they're calling back earlier vocabulary or themes, and that's a really useful way to set up a conversation between two texts. The reason to pull that up in Helaman chapter 5 is because the book of Helaman does this extensively. So the book of Helaman is constantly referring back to characters who appear earlier in the Book of Mormon. We have we have references to Alma, Amulek, Zeezrom, King Benjamin, Nephi, and Lehi, of course. We also have a number of themes and images that only appear one other place in the Book of Mormon. Um, but to my mind, the most significant series of parallels in this chapter is back to the vision of the Tree of Life, actually, that Lehi has in 1 Nephi 8. Here, too, we have... Um, kind of a misty cloud of darkness that overshadows the people in the prison. We have a, an architectural structure that seems to be shaken to its foundations. This is the great and spacious building for Lehi, but it shows up as a prison in Helaman chapter 5. We even have this kind of vertical, bright and shiny structure. For Lehi, that was his tree of life. For the people in Helaman 5, that's the pillars of fire that come down and surround the Lamanites. So it seems to me that this is a classic case of intertextuality. Part of what Helaman 5 is doing is drawing together images that should make us think back to Lehi's vision of the Tree of Life. That's the conversation that Mormon wants to stage at this point in Nephite history. Let's talk about how Nephi enters the scene here. This is in the third chapter of your book, Nephi, the son of Helaman. He's been gone from the capital city for six years. What do you see happening here? Right. So Nephi has been on a mission up in the northward territory with his brother and some new Lamanite converts, uh, and he hasn't had much success. Everywhere he goes among the Lamanites, he seems to find some success, but anywhere he's going in Nephite territory turns out badly. So after six years, he, he heads home. Home for him is the city of Zarahemla, and it seems as though as soon as he sets foot in his home city after six years, he is absolutely, absolutely shocked at the degree of depravity that he finds among his people. In just six years, things have gone so far downhill that he's kind of overcome, and we get this interesting emotional outburst. He decides to climb up on a tower in his garden, apparently. And he starts just bearing his soul, crying in a lot, crying with a loud voice, lamenting how much wickedness has come upon his people in this short period. Um, and this, I, I say, I, it's not clear to me whether it's accidentally or by design, but one way or another, this draws a crowd, and then there follows Nephi's intervention among the people. And Nephi is really focused on getting the people to look. Looking is another theme here. Yes. So once again, Mormon wants us to keep focus on where the Nephite's eyes are. And in this case, um, first of all, it's interesting to notice that they are very focused on Nephi. And you can kind of, the, the, the basic tenor of the conversation they have with Nephi is that he can see everything that's wrong with them, but they can't seem to see it. And they're all gathered around his tower, kind of bewildered, wondering why on earth a prophet could be lamenting like this. Everything seems to be going great. What could possibly be wrong? So in that moment, what Nephi can see, they cannot. They have completely failed to see themselves and the status of their own hearts. The other thing, once again, that they've failed to see is the way that secret combinations with their focus on wealth and violence have taken root among the people. And this is what Nephi then condemns in the speech that follows. And Nephi is granted a unique power here. This is a sealing power that we don't really see in other scriptures in, in exactly the same way. I don't think it's what Latter-day Saints often think of today when they think of the sealing power. Talk about that a little bit. Right. 
This comes in Helaman chapter 11. Nephi tries to get the Nephites to repent as prophets do, and he fails. The Nephites are just not having it. And so he kind of turns tail, heads home, and the Lord stops him and grants him the sealing power. And this is, again, as you mentioned, this is not the sealing power as Latter-day Saints know it. The Lord doesn't want Nephi to form a new church. He doesn't want Nephi to seal families up for eternal life so they can live together forever. What he seems to want Nephi to do is to seal the heavens, to institute a famine. And so this, I think, is a new kind of way of thinking about sealing. What the Lord seems to want Nephi to do, he says there that, that the sealing power will amount to whatever Nephi says, it will be done. Whatever word Nephi gives, it will, be, it will immediately become an action. And this, I think, is important because this is what the Nephites are lacking. They are not, their words are unstable. This is a time of secret oaths and political intrigue and mm. duplicity. And people are not saying what they mean. They're not being self-honest in a way that has now resulted in a lot of moral depravity for the people. And so part of what Nephi is being given is a way to tie words down to actions, to deeds, in a way that he hopes and the Lord hopes will help them face up to their situation. And how are the people reacting to that? He's He's lamenting, he's giving these prophetic declarations about things that they've been doing wrong. What's the reaction of the people? There are a number of reactions, interestingly. Um, first, primary among them seems to be just outrage, complete outrage that anyone would dare to say that things are not going great among the Nephites. Mm. They're, they're quite pleased with their economic expansion and secret combinations as a technique for gaining more money and more power. So there's a lot of outrage among the Nephites. That outrage comes from those in power and from everybody else. I read just a lot of bewilderment. They cannot seem to understand why Nephi is saying the things that he is. Um, now, interestingly, after Nephi institutes a famine and then successfully repeals the famine, then everybody loves Nephi. As soon as it becomes a question of getting their rainfall back and not starving to death, then they're really fond of him. Let's talk more about secret combinations, because this is something from the text that's really generated a lot of discussion over the years. I think a lot of readers are eager to identify who today are these secret combinations. And we see the, a rise in conspiracy theory thinking. And, and so how did you handle this part of the text? Great question. So I think the fascination with secret combinations has been around for basically as long as the Book of Mormon has been around. And it's a really natural fascination. This phenomenon is just so interesting. We have secret intrigue. We have murders in the streets by night. It's just, it's a great story. So it really captures our attention and our imagination. Um, but what I see Mormon doing here with secret combinations is once again, asking readers to learn how to look for things that are hidden, not among others, but among themselves in their own hearts. Because the crucial thing about the secret combinations that I think readers constantly miss is that the secret combinations are not the enemy of the Nephites. The secret combinations are the Nephites. Nephites are secret combinations. Um, the people who join these bands are Nephites. This, these bands overtake the people until they've completely saturated the government. There is no difference between the Nephites at large and the secret combinations by the end of the book. And so I think that one of our I think a real danger in reading the book of Helaman is that we might too sharply differentiate these groups. The lesson is not that the Nephites should have been more hypervigilant against secret combinations. The lesson is that they are the secret combinations and they failed to see the way that their own hearts gave rise to this kind of wickedness. Do you think it would be easy still to take those secret combinations and map them onto a current political ideology? Or is the text focused on secret combinations as a political ideology or more as a political tactic? Yeah, I certainly don't think that it's a political ideology, though it has often been taken that way. Secret combinations do get caught up in our own political discourse both left and right. What I see as most crucial about secret combinations or most revealing in their role among the Nephites um, is they reveal how interested the Nephites themselves are in power. And this I think is a lesson that we often miss. So what makes secret combinations so attractive to the Nephites is because they look like a technique for gaining power, gaining power over one's enemies, political or military. There's, they seem like a really good way to get power. 
The problem when we then use secret combinations to identify other people on our political landscape today is that we sometimes miss the way that we ourselves then fall into the same trap of playing power games. I've seen this. So as I've been working on a book on Helaman, people ask me this question often. What are secret combinations? Where do you think secret combinations are? I've heard this from people of all political persuasions. And what everyone uniquely seems to miss is that in that question, we ourselves risk thirsting for power. We ourselves are looking for a way to gain power over those with whom we disagree. The lesson of secret combinations, I think, is not find ways to gain more power over other people. It's notice the ways that you're thirsty for power. The reason secret combinations took root among the Nephites unnoticed was because there was a market for power and money among the Nephites. That's where secret combinations got their start. And you also point out with that, that the people that were doing the secret combinations also were spreading their own secret combination theories about other people. They, they, were, they had a propaganda campaign against leaders of the church, for example, saying that, oh, don't listen to Nephi and these people. They're just setting themselves up to have power over you. So they're almost telling on themselves in the accusations that they're making about their opposition. Exactly. So this comes in the very last chapter of the book of Helaman, chapter 16. There's this fascinating moment, I think, where um, this is after Samuel the Lamanite has come to preach. Um, again, the people reject him as well. And they explain why they reject him and his signs. Um, it's... It's the unbelievers in Helaman 16 who are the real conspiracy theorists of this text. They are so concerned that religion is just a ploy to get power over them and their lives that in fact they are the conspiracy theorists. And so if we come away from the book of Helaman thinking that this is licensed to then um, ferret out uh, the power games of others with whom we disagree, there's a risk that we have become exactly like the unbelievers of the text, not the people that Mormon most wants us to emulate. That's Kimberly Matheson Berkey. She's a doctoral student in theology at Loyola University, Chicago. She also serves on the boards of the Latter-day Saint Theology Seminar and the Book of Mormon Studies Association. And you can find some of her previous work in articles she's published in the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. She joins us today from Chicago, Illinois. We're talking via Skype, safe and distance from each other on a computer screen. And it's <laughs> stranger than being in person. So thank you for doing this. And I'm going to skip over chapter four. People that want uh, to find out more about what you do with Helaman chapter 12, you cover that in your fourth chapter. I'm going to refer them to the book. It's a fascinating chapter. But for lack of time, let's scoot forward to chapter five, where we're introduced to another first in the text. This is the first time that we're introduced to a Lamanite prophet. And you say that this remarkable figure, Samuel the Lamanite, is presented in the text as a foil to Nephi. Tell us about that. The way the book of Helaman is structured, Nephi and Samuel are set up as right in parallel. So the book ends with a Nephite prophet and a Lamanite prophet, and they become kind of partners in illustrating Nephite wickedness at this period of the story. And we can see that in the way that they are uh, a number of textual details that set them alongside one another. So one is a Nephite and one is a Lamanite, certainly, but both are interrupted uh, on the way home. They're commissioned while they're headed someplace else. Um, they both use similar language. Certainly, they also both leave the story together. Our last mention of Nephi comes right after Samuel exits the story. Um, they both use this curious double phrase, repent ye, repent ye. Usually that's never said twice in a row, but both of them use that phrase. They're both very good at scripting the language of the people they're trying to diagnose. Um, most interestingly, I think they both issue curses. Nephi curses the land. This is how we get a famine. And then just a few chapters later, Samuel talks about a curse on the land in the form of riches that will slip away once buried. Uh, so I think, I think whatever we're going to learn from Nephi and from Samuel, Mormon wants us to read them together as partners in this ministry. Right, so you've laid out the compare. Now let's take a look at the contrast. What's the differences between these two? The differences between the two, well, it starts in one further similarity. Both of them issue two signs to the people. So Nephi 
gives signs of his own prophetic ability when he tells the people that their chief judge has been murdered and what the murderer will say when confronted. These are his two signs. Samuel's two signs are very different. He gives two signs of the Messiah's coming, a day, uh, three days of light, three days of darkness. These are his two signs. And I use this, this seems to me an indication of the kind of scope of their respective prophecies. So Nephi is very focused on local political concerns among the Nephites. That is the, the level of his intervention. But then we also get Samuel, an excellent partner for Nephi, because his scope is grander. It's more cosmic. He can see 400 years into the future, not just a few hours. Um, and so I think together between them, I think I use the example of um, a wide angle lens and a fine zoom for hmm. Samuel and Nephi respectively. And once again, we see Mormon using every kind of visual apparatus at his disposal to help us see the Nephites more clearly. And for Samuel, he gives them these signs to watch for. Do you think these signs are supposed to lead to faith? Like, is he giving them things to say, I'm going to prove it to you, this is going to happen. You watch, this is going to happen. What's happening here in terms of how signs and faith work together? I'm glad you ask because Samuel does something very surprising theologically. Usually in scripture, uh, when a prophet talks about the relationship between signs and faith, he says that faith comes first. Signs don't cause faith. Faith comes first, and then if you prove faithful, you will receive signs. Samuel flips that on his head. He says, I'm giving you these signs so that you might believe, so that there will be no cause for unbelief. That's the second phrase he uses. And that that should shock us all because that's not how prophets usually talk. So Samuel is doing something diff interesting. Samuel is doing something interesting in the relationship between signs and faith. And it seems that what he wants to do, the way he lays this out, he says that signs are a way of unsettling the Nephites' knowledge, their confidence. And that we see this in the way that his signs operate. So he says, for instance, in the three days of miraculous light, he says, you will watch the sun rise and the sun set. You will know of a surety that the sun has gone down and it is now nighttime. Nevertheless, it will still be bright. You know something. Nevertheless, what you thought was the case is no longer proving to be true. And so for him, the signs are a way of unsettling the Nephites' knowledge, the things they think they know, the things they're so confident in. The signs are a way of showing them that their knowledge is not sufficient to understand what's happening around them. And this, he says, will then unsettle them enough that maybe hopefully they can turn to faith. They will find cause for belief and no cause for unbelief in the unsettling of their knowledge. Did the Nephites notice the irony in a Lamanite coming to them? I mean, they've been comparing themselves to the Lamanites this whole time. And of course, we see later in the Book of Mormon, they don't even want to record it. When Jesus comes, he says, hey, where's the prophecy of Samuel? Right. Jesus comes and specifically asks, this prophecy was fulfilled. Why haven't you recorded the fulfillment of it? The Nephites don't seem to see the irony, tragically. Mormon wants to make sure that we do, but the Nephites don't seem to see it. In fact, in the middle of his sermon, Samuel says... You're not listening because I'm a Lamanite. Because I am a Lamanite, one of these people you hate so much, you're not, you're not proving receptive to my message. So it seems that rather than seeing the irony and that being a wake-up call, um, they, they continue to hate the Lamanites so much that they will refuse even this messenger with his divine commission and impressive signs. I'd like to hear one more explanation of something you wrote in the book here I've underlined. It says, for Samuel, faith is neither a stepping stone on the way to certainty or the starting line of our spiritual race. So if it's neither the stepping stone on the way to certainty, like faith exists until you get certain, or you must have faith to begin on your race to certainty. Right, I think faith comes in the middle. It's part of the process. It's not just a starting place, and it's also not an ending place. Faith is something that we carry with us along the way to help temper our knowledge. So I think the place we start, um, as the whole plan of salvation starts, is with knowledge. That's where Adam and Eve begin. They take fruit from the tree of knowledge. And we know this, we've, we've, we've been growing up ever since we were kids. We have been learning and gaining knowledge about how the world works. The trick is to make sure that that knowledge is always held carefully and paired with faith, that we never grow too hardened in the things we think we know, because that is a recipe for disaster. You don't learn, you can't progress that way. So in to my mind, Samuel is giving us a picture of faith as a necessary accompaniment to knowledge, something we carry with us on our journey 
That's Kimberly Berkey, and we're talking to her about her book, Helaman, A Brief Theological Introduction. It's part of the Maxwell Institute's Brief Theological Introduction series to the Book of Mormon, a series of books where we invited individual scholars to write individual books about individual books in the Book of Mormon, and Helaman is the one we're talking about today. If you want to learn more about that series, you can go to the Maxwell Institute's website, mi.byu.edu slash brief. You can learn all about the volumes that have already come out. You can order those books, and you can learn about the books that have yet to come out and pre-order them when they're available. All right, Kim, here's a quote here from the conclusion to your book. You say, one reading of the book of Helaman leaves us with an inescapable conclusion. You and I are wrong. What did you mean by that? It seems to me that the book of Helaman is so insistent that we learn to look at ourselves, to investigate ourselves, not to get distracted by all the many things with the, that want to catch our eye. Other people, political intrigue, wealth, um, all of these things are distractions from the real moral task, which is one of self-investigation and self-improvement. To my mind, the gospel is one of the best tools we have for improving ourselves, for guarding against dangerous spiritual impulses. But to make it work, we have to be willing to look at ourselves honestly, to assess the ways that we fall short. And when we do that, we will find without fail that we are wrong about a lot of things. We, we, we believe things that aren't true. We behave contrary to what we know is right. We fall short in so many ways. So what I meant with that line I hope that when we read the book of Helaman, we come away feeling spurred to greater self-reflection and more humility, rather than galvanized into being distracted by more of the things that so often want to catch our eye. The message of the book of Helaman is that if we are to avoid the fate of the Nephites, we need to be far more self-critical and uh, honest in our self-assessments. This is precisely what they failed to do. Hmm. And before we go, I'd also like to talk just a little bit about theology and how you define it. It's interesting to hear from the different authors, because I think different authors have different definitions of what doing theology even is. And, and by the way, I think that's by design in this series. We wanted to get a variety of voices. The editors, Spencer Fluman and Phil Barlow, really made it a point to get a variety of perspectives. So let's talk about your understanding of theology and what it means to do theology, to think theologically, and those type of things. Well, somewhat in the kind of classic cliche is an etymological one, which is that theology is the word of God, words about God, words spoken by God. Is this what Webster says? Is that where you... Right, right. <laughs> um, and I think uh, maybe a more lively way to put that is that theology is the, the conversation sparked by God and that we have with God as disciples. And so theology is a way of entering into that conversation. You read the words from God, scripture, that are words about God, and you speak to and about God in response. So you put, you're sure to put God into that mix as well. We often hear people say theology is talking about God, but you point out specifically that it also includes talking with God. Yes, and for me, I think that's because scripture plays a central role in how I conceive of the task of theology. Theology is not just talking about God, it's talking about God in conjunction with the words that he has given us in the form of scripture. So I see scripture as kind of the opening bid in a conversation from heaven to earth, and my job Job as a disciple is then to take very seriously the words he's given, to find new readings, to dig into them, to see the patterns that are there, and that then by wagering my interpretations on these words, I can join the conversation. Do you find difficulty sometimes in reading a text that was written so long ago? The Book of Mormon is an ancient record where people are thinking about God and interacting with God and presenting their ideas about God in ways that don't even always line up with contemporary Latter-day Saint thought. So, for example, Latter-day Saints today would talk about the afterlife and three degrees of glory and, and not, a, not a strict heaven-hell dichotomy like we find in the Book of Mormon. So sometimes we encounter things in the text that don't align as well with where we're at today. How do you reckon with those type of things? These can be a challenge. I've In my Sunday school class and with many people I've spoken with, this is a real challenge to reading the Book of Mormon today. A lot of people struggle to make contemporary sense of a book that reads so differently from many of our own modern values. Um, my own approach to this has been that whenever the text presents these kinds of these sticking points, these places that are hard to make sense of, 
usually that's a sign that I have not dug in enough. So an easy metaphor to use here is driving a car. When you hit a speed bump on the road, your two worst options are to speed up or to shut the car down. Speed bumps are not an invitation to just abandon the journey altogether. They're an invitation to slow down. Um, I think reading scripture functions much the same way. When we encounter challenges in the text, that's not occasion to toss the book aside or to just plow straight through. These are the moments that God has put there to arrest us sometimes, to ask us to slow down and wrestle and join him in the conversation. And that's what theology can help us do. It's it's that ongoing engagement, that willingness to slow down and, and, and to keep driving. Precisely. Hmm. That's Kimberly Matheson Berkey. She's a doctoral student in theology at Loyola University, Chicago. How much time do you have left, by the way? Well, that's the magic question, because all that's standing between me and the end is the dissertation. So uh, yes. uh, however long have the you, dissertation takes, that's how long it takes. Do you have a topic on that yet? I'm writing on prayer, actually. How did you arrive at that as the topic? I've always been interested in prayer, uh, just kind of... So I knew it was a topic that I could sustain long-term attention on. And for me, prayer is kind of where the rubber hits the road of my own devotional life. Sometimes we treat prayer as just the pragmatic side. There's nothing really interesting or theologically or theoretical at stake in prayer. And so part of what I want to do is think through the philosophical side of that. What is happening when I get down on my knees and offer a prayer to heaven? All right. Well, thank you for talking to us today. I, I should also let people know again as a reminder that uh, Kim serves on the boards of the Latter-day Saint Theology Seminar and the Book of Mormon Studies Association. And is the conference for that happening this year? It is. Yes. Do they know if it's going to be in person? or? We're waiting to hear from USU up in Logan. So we're going to follow their guidelines. Um, whatever form we do the conference in, it is happening and it will be socially distanced in one form or another. But we're waiting to hear back from them. Right. And, and where can people learn more about that? At our website. That's bomsa.org. So B-O-M-S-A dot org. All right, great. And you're the author of Helaman, A Brief Theological Introduction. It's part of the Maxwell Institute's Brief Theological Introductions to the Book of Mormon series. Kim, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time today, joining me via Skype to talk about your book. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. We're three quarters of the way through the Book of Mormon now. Can you believe that we still have to cover third and fourth Nephi? Uh, that's Daniel Becerra. Mormon, which is Adam Miller, Ether from Rosalind Welch, and the Book of Moroni from David Holland. And I've been hearing from a few more completists of the Maxwell Institute podcast. These are people who've made it through every episode to date, and we're preparing a little bonus gift for those who've made the entire journey. You can send me an email if you're a completist, and we'll get you on the list. The email's mipodcastbyu.edu. I can't remember if I've already sent greetings to Ben and Katie Stanley, Tony Brown, and David Hogan yet. They're completists. So once things get settled down in the world, we'll be sending something special their way. All right, our featured podcast review comes from Holly CSC. She gave us five stars and she writes, I've truly enjoyed how this podcast has helped me see gospel principles from new angles. After each episode, I have a lot to ponder. I often find myself going back to listen again in order to gain more clarity and perspective. I've especially enjoyed the interviews with authors of the brief theological introductions to the Book of Mormon. The latest one with Kylie Nilsson Turley about Alma was eye-opening. Each time a new episode pops up, I'm thrilled to find a new corner of the house to clean so I can spend time filling my mind with deep thought while doing monotonous work of life. All right. Well, thank you, Holly. I also enjoy listening to podcasts while doing the monotonous work of life, doing work around the house as well. Thank you for that review. I hope to see more reviews. You can leave reviews in Apple Podcasts. You can leave a comment on Facebook or YouTube where we also post audio. I'm Blair Hodges for the Maxwell Institute, and I'll talk to you again next time on the Maxwell Institute podcast.